Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are glad to have you here at Moore Park Presbyterian Church. Karen is here. Good morning, Karen. How are you? She's like, I'm never going to come late ever again. I'm kidding. You're not late. You're not late. Them in the back, they're late. No, no, no. Welcome. Uh, I'm Keenan Barber, pastor here at uh, Moore Park Presbyterian Church, and um, we have so much going on this morning, and so I'm just going to begin with a word of prayer. Would you pray with me? God, thank you uh, for this church and that they represent Jesus in this community so well. And we ask as we gather this morning and uh, we find inspiration from coming closer to you that you might allow us as um, just a congregation to put away the distractions and be, have our full attention to you. We thank you that you love us in spite of the fact that we go the wrong ways, in spite of the fact that we're absent-minded and we forget that you are supposed to be at the center of our lives. This is our chance to come back and be centered on you. So may it be so. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and stand, sing this first song together.
you to turn right now and greet one another, giving thanks for the Lord and each other. Bonjour. Be our guest, be our guest, put our service to the test. Bacon, sausage, eggs, and muffins, we will only serve the best. A Christmas brunch, you will remember, it's the 2nd of December. There's a speaker to inspire, boutique goodies to acquire. Be our guest, be our guest, we want women to be blessed. Please sign up, we will suggest, for a morning free of stress. Be our guest, be our guest, be our guest. How do you follow Choctoberfest and be our guest? I'm telling you, wow. Well, it's time for um, our announcements. And first is that we have the friendship pads at the um, left-hand side of each pew. Love to have you um, fill out that you're here. Let us know. We'd be super glad to ha have you um, on our list for mailings, for um, just everything that's going on. And speaking of those things, tonight is the annual Thanksgiving dinner. We hope that um, you're going to be with us. Um, and next week, next Sunday after service, we're going to decorate the sanctuary to prepare for um, our Advent season. 
and we would love to have you, whether you can give us five minutes or five hours. No, not that long, I promise. Uh, whether you can give us a few minutes or, or help us until we get it all up, we would just love to have you all with us. Um, the 2024 Junior Senior High Winter Camp is just around the corner and it's available for everyone to sign up online right now. So um, just go online. If you have any questions, um, speak to Sean. He can answer more, but they'll be at Forest Home again. And then for December, we have a couple more things beside um, the women's brunch. Um, we have our first annual edible nativity making event. Um, that'll be on Sunday the 3rd. That's the first Sunday of Advent. Uh, you can sign up in, online or in the lobby. And then our MPC Family Christmas will be on December the 10th, and you can RSVP for all of those today. And now I would like to ask Dan Birchfield to come forward and pray for us. Let us pray. Dear God, we come before you as a church family and thank you for the gift of today and your grace and mercy to each new day. Please be with us throughout each day and help us navigate whatever comes our way. Most importantly, help us to reflect and live out our lives in a way that is honoring you. Lord, we ask you to energize our hearts with strength and purpose. Lord, we ask you to ignite our spirit and set our day full of promise. When we face the difficult, open our eyes to see the faithfulness. When we are weary, let us not miss the blessings still surrounding us. Lord, we pray that you bless our church family at the All Church Thanksgiving dinner tonight as we all gather to together and count our blessings with a grateful hearts. Heavenly Father, we ask you to comfort those who mourn the loss of loved ones, especially during the holidays. Lord, we continue to pray until there's lasting peace in the Middle East. And God, open up our hearts and our eyes as a church family during Advent to see our community as we would see them. Give us the courage to shine your light on those around us. So let us join together with a united heart and a collective voice to recite the prayer that your son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. All right, I invite you to stand.
and take away You give and take away My heart will choose to say Lord, blessed be your name Give and take away You give and take away My heart will choose to say As we think about how we can count the many blessings in our life for the abundance of God's love and care for us and how he walks alongside us in every step of our lives. And so if you're new here to the church, this is the time when we, we take our tithes and our offerings and there are a couple of plates at the back of the room that you could drop an offering if you like on your way out. It also could... Um, do so online at our website, and um, you can also send a check in the mail. But right now, take a moment to think as we move into this week of Thanksgiving, what it is that you count as your blessings and how you are thankful to the Lord. I invite you to stand. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son. All right, it's time to dismiss our Kids for Children's Church. Miss Cammie and her team are in the back. I love that they're so excited. That's amazing. I'm going to ask the rest of you to stay standing. Oh, no, yes. Did I miss something? No, I didn't. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Your name is 
before in that um, what happened was is we had a new members class and then after new members class what we do is we uh, bring the people who went through the new members class and we bring them in front of the congregation we ask them some questions we ask you some questions and we do that and then we realize gosh there's some people that didn't make that first class because life was going on and so we had a second time that we did that and we thought we got everybody and then forgetting that there was a whole family that for some reason for like eight or nine weeks, one family member had COVID and then the next family had never had COVID. And I just assumed that everybody had gone through. And a couple of weeks ago, Joshua said to me, um, do you think we could like do that whole finish up the new members thing now? And I was like, oh, that didn't happen. So my spiritual gift is not administration, obviously, because you <laughs> fell through the cracks. I'm sorry, so sorry for that. But I'm going to have you come forward. Mark Van Dam's going to come forward and help me with this as well. Um, so well, this is a time when we receive new members, and uh, Joshua and his wife, Angel, you guys can come up here, because you, you, I mean, we want people to see you. If you're down there, they can't see you all that well. So it's a, a time uh, when we're reminded um, of our own baptism, our own professions of faith, and our commitment to discipleship over a long period of time. And these uh, guys went through the class, and they talked to an elder, and they did all the right things. It's just they went, they went off and got COVID, um, and so they couldn't be here, and we blew it. And so you're here now, and it's God's timing. It's not my timing. It's not your timing. It's God's timing. So we're glad you're here. And so I have a couple of questions to ask you. Those questions are going to be on the screen. So if you don't think that I'm pronouncing things very well, then you can you know, correct me by reading it yourself. Um, and some of you are just visual, and you want to see those questions. So I'm going to ask you these questions. Uh, do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, and Son, and Holy Spirit. If so, say we do. One down. I got four more to go. Okay. Do you intend to be Christ's disciple, to obey his word, and to show his love? Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you be a faithful member of this congregation, share in its worship and ministry through your prayers and gifts, and study and service, and so fulfill your calling to be a disciple of Jesus? 
Very good. Mark has questions for you as a congregation because as much as they have responsibility to be a part of the congregation, we have a responsibility congregation to welcome them in and to make sure that they know where the coffee is and all those kind of good things. They've been here long enough. They know where the coffee is. They know where the donuts are. But to be able to assimilate into the life of the congregation. And so you all are going to go ahead and stand. And Mark's going to ask you a question. Thank you, Keenan. So the correct answer is we do just in case you're wondering. All right. And uh, in your honor, we're having a very special dinner party tonight for you. So we've never done that before, but welcome. Do we agree to receive these new members with love, to pray for them as they integrate into the life of the church, encourage them in their faith walk, and guide them as they seek to serve Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? Do we agree? We do. You may be seated. So normally at this time, what I would do is I would pray for them, um, but I'm going to let them share a little bit about who they are and their story because um, we don't normally get to do that. We have a big group of people up here normally for a numerous class. It's just them. So I'm going to have them share a little bit of their story and then we'll pray for them after you share. You want to pray? Oh, I can. You, his notes are on your iPad. Oh, your notes are on your iPad. <laughs> yeah, you can't have them. You have to, you have to trust the Lord in this. You can't. Trust your iPad. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You good? Okay. Testing? Hey, it's, it works. Cool. Um, okay, so in case we haven't met, uh, my name is Joshua Hamza. This is my wife, Angel. And we're the ones that sit up here at the front, uh, accidentally blocking your view during wor worship. So, sorry about that. Uh, but my wife and I, we have similar testimonies, and we just can't help but praise. God has done a miraculous work in our lives. We know what Jesus saved us from. Oh, I hit the wrong button. Sorry, guys. Hang on. So I grew up in the church. Uh, my mom was a, uh, my single mom was a new Christian, so she was on fire, which meant that we were in church several times a week. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, so youth group, Awana, vacation, Bible school, you name it, we were at the church, which means I grew up knowing a lot about God. But I'll come back to that. When I was 14, I ran away for the first time. My parents were strict, so I got grounded a lot growing up. And in my teenage years, I just didn't want to be at home. That was the first time I got put in handcuffs. The next time was when my parents called the school and had them search me, and they found poems about killing my classmates. After I got out of a mental institution, my writings got me in trouble again six months later about my parents this time. So they had me charged with felony harassment and removed from the home. I was put on probation, assigned to live at a homeless shelter for at-risk youth. Not long after that, I stayed out after the shelter's curfew. Needing a place to go, I was taken in by a local pedophile ring. My story didn't get much better from there. In the last half of Romans 1, Paul talks about the justice of God's wrath for all manner of unrighteousness. And I deserved all of it. I've been a liar, a thief, a prostitute, a drug addict, a drug dealer, a gang member, an adulterer, an identity thief. Nearly every single thing that a parent could pray for their child not to engage in I did, and I encouraged others to do the same. I've been, I've been molested, pimped, beaten, robbed, and taken hostage. By the time I got raided, I was being investigated by the Secret Service for federal weapons and forgery charges. So what happened? Well, in September of 2014, I was at a house where there was a car parked in the driveway that had just been used in a drive-by shooting. The police kicked in the door of the house I was at and arrested everyone. I gave them my fake ID, but there was no hiding who I was once the police fingerprinted me. I'll never forget it. The next morning, a guard came to, to my cell and said, well, Mr. Has a bunch of names here is going to Idaho. So I was put in a cell in Los Angeles County Jail to await extradition, where I was virtually guaranteed to go to prison. And wouldn't you know it, I ended up being bunkmates with a man who led the Bible study in our pod. Well, I'd heard all the stories growing up, and it's not like I was busy anyway, so I accepted his invitation. I have no idea what it was that we studied. All I know is that afterwards, I walked back into my cell and got absolutely wrecked by the Holy Spirit. I went from laughing and joking in the hallway to bawling my eyes out, overwhelmed by the awareness that everything in my life was poison, and even the things that I thought were good that I was doing were hurting other people. For the first time, I realized what surrender is, and I told Jesus, my life isn't worth anything, but if you want it, you can have it. The next step was obvious. I, I knew I needed to get a Bible. 
I started reading and studying, highlighting, underlining, meditating on God's word, finally getting to know Jesus instead of just know about him. I learned that God not just welcomes, he actively seeks the lost, the broken, the downtrodden, the afflicted, and the weak, like me. He invites prodigals to come home. Well, the state of Idaho was also inviting me to come home. <laughs> but miraculously, the Secret Service didn't end up indicting me. I did still have to go to prison, but despite absconding from probation and forcing the state to uh, pay to come get me, the judge didn't impose the entire six-year sentence I had hanging over my head. In Isaiah 55, 11, God says his word will not return void. And I was baptized in a chapel of an Idaho prison on my 25th birthday. I can relate a lot to the book of Joel. God's children, who knew him, had chosen to rebel. But God promises in chapter 2 that if his children will come back to him, he'll restore. Well, I've been charged with 30 felonies in three states. But eight years ago, last July, I got out of prison and haven't been put in handcuffs since. I haven't put a needle in my arm since the day I got arrested. After getting out of prison, I chose to go to rehab and completed the 12 steps. I have a healthy relationship with my family today. My, God, my mom spent years praying for me and now calls me sometimes to pray for her. I had dropped out of high school, but today I'm licensed by the North American Board of Certified Energy Professionals and have completed a pastoral training program. I'm remarried. We've been, we've been blessed with a beautiful baby boy. I was homeless for a decade, but less than seven years after getting out of prison, my wife and I bought a house in Fillmore. So that's why we worship the way that we do. Because God's been so good to us. I was dead in sin, but today I'm alive in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, and the new has come. I tried changing on my own. I couldn't do it, and I still can't. But he can. He did a miracle in my life. And if he can do it for me, he can do it for you. Thank you. Let me pray for you. God, we're thankful uh, that you've called these two to be a part of our family. And we pray um, that you continue to strengthen them uh, by your spirit, that you continue to strengthen their marriage, you continue to strengthen their ability to parent well, continue to use their story uh, in order to uh, tell your story, the bigger story. Um, and we pray that you um, would find just the right place in this congregation for them to serve. And um, we're just thankful that they're here um, and that we uh, get to walk alongside of them, figuring out what it is that God calls each of us to do. Bless them. Keep them. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. God is so very, very good. After hearing your story, I, I never would have imagined because you both have such joy whenever I see you. The, the greatness of God's love lives through you both so intently. It's just, thank you for sharing that. It's, it's so beautiful. All my words fall short. I got nothing new. How could I express all my gratitude? I could sing these songs as I often do, but every song.
Sometimes transitions are hard. Let's just acknowledge that, shall we say, Sam? So I'm like, the, all that's taking place and going into the first line that's written here and going, okay, how does this... So I'll just read it. Uh, when my grandfather died during my senior year of college, it's a great transition, right? Uh, it was hard and strange and different um, than about anything I had ever experienced before. See, his name uh, was Keenan. Clarence Barber, and they called him KC. My dad is Kenan Frank Barber. I'm Kenan Thomas Barber, and there is Kenan Charles Barber. And so this young man um, has the unfortunate sort of, um, I don't know, uh, 
weight to carry that you have the Keenan name to carry, and I'm not the third because we all have different middle names. Um, that's why they don't call me the third or call you the fourth um, or whatever it is. Um, but it's Keenan obviously gets thrown down, and then Jen's dad's first name is Charles, so he is Keenan Charles, and so he gets called KC, and so it's like he represents the Keenans and the other side of the family and my grandfather, and I can remember actually making the phone call. Maybe I've told the story before. I call my dad, and I tell him we've had a boy, and he says this, and I say it's Keenan Charles Barber, but we're going to call him KC, and he's bawling on the phone. And his wife is like, what's wrong? What's wrong? He's fine. I can't talk. Just talk to him. You know, it's like, um, so everybody was honored when all that took place. And so, KC, uh, you have a lot to carry, but that's a whole other conversation and a whole other sermon. I'm glad you're here to, to you know, to carry that. Um, at my grandfather's funeral um, with a cousin, we actually sang How Great Thou Art, like we sang at the beginning of the service today. So every time I hear that song sung today, it, has a, it sits a little bit differently. I, I carry it a little bit differently. I sing it a little bit differently based on that was what was at my grandfather's um, service. And we went back to the house after the service, and I think it was, uh, I was given the opportunity along with a couple of my cousins. They said, here's uh, some of the possessions of your grandfather. Would you like to have any of these things? And it's a kind of a strange thing, but, you know, I, I took uh, his, uh, his travel shaving kit and, uh, and a couple of ties and a jacket, and, and I, I still use some of those things, right? And then a couple of years later when my grandmother died, um, I went out to Pittsfield, Illinois for the memorial service. And after the service was over, I was in their house with my dad and my aunt and my cousins again. And again, there was this offer to take anything in the house that you wanted to. And again, it is the most bizarre feeling, right? But it was just an absolutely positively strange to try to figure out what is it that I'm going to take from this house that somehow or another is going to sort of replace grandma and grandpa, right? It, it wasn't going to happen, right? That nothing could replace my grandfather. Nothing could replace my grandmother. And it got me thinking about sort of the things that we leave behind, right? The things that we're going to pass along. It was, for them, was it, a, was it this three-bedroom, um, you know, brick house that my, my grandfather built with his, old, his own hands? Was it the appliances that were left in the house? Was it the two cars in the garage that had gone kind of unused over the last number of years of their lives? What, what was their legacy? Was it about that stuff that was in the house? And as we conclude our series on stewardship, um, the question that I want to propose to you is, what will the legacy of MPC, Moore Park Presbyterian Church, be long after we're all gone? And how can each of us participate in ensuring that the legacy lives on and on and thrives into the future? And this is where script, the scriptures can be helpful to us, right? And none more helpful than the words spoken by Jesus himself. So we take this passage, actually, it's from kind of the, the largest amount of teaching that Jesus will do in the New Testament. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And it's like three or four chapters long. It's, it's immense. And he teaches about lots of different things. And one of the things that he teaches about is about our stuff. And um, we're going to read these couple of verses together. This is uh, from Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 19. If you're going to go ahead and stand up and let's read this passage of scripture together. Let's read. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Let me pray for us as we begin to look through this passage. Now, thanks for a chance for it to be together. I'm thankful that um, you've given us this word for today. We pray that you would speak to each of us through it. And God, let nothing that I might say get in the way of what you would want your people to hear this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So the world of advertising is set up in such a way to convince you that there are things on this earth that are absolutely, positively essential in order for you to have, in order to survive in the real world, right? Things like Ginsu knives and pillow pets and smart water 
and lickable cat treats, right? These are just, you have to have these things, right? And what's interesting about marketing is that it's not just that they're marketing to you as adults. Really what they're doing is that they're spending lots of time trying to convince you that that what's going to happen in McDonald's is that they're going to sell you a meal and there's going to be this little tiny gift in the bottom of it and you're going to convince the kids to come because they need that little gift. And if they don't have that little gift, they're like their friends have that little gift and it's like they haven't gotten what's really important in the world, right? And so they start them off early. Lots of commercials are for kids, right? And so this consumer mentality is there from the beginning. And it's like this. They already know there's, if I don't have these things, if I don't possess these things, then I'm going to be left out. I'm going to be left behind in some sort of way. And so we're convinced that the things that will somehow, that we'll have, will fill the emptiness we have in our lives. And we soon learn that the we soon learn that the accumulation of all of this stuff does nothing more than fill up our closets and our garages with more stuff. Jesus wants to make it clear that these treasures on earth are going to, they're going to be temporary, right? Treasures in the first century were concentrated really into three categories, precious metals or stone, stored food, and clothing. Those are kind of the three categories, right? Jesus points out that all these are susceptible to loss. They are things that are naturally be eaten away, like moths on your favorite sweater or rats for your favorite fruit. They're going to be gone eventually, right? And then there's also, there's thieves that can come in and they can take those things away from you, right? Steal them away from you. Suffice to say, these are not the things that we should be spending our time and energy storing up for ourselves here while we're on the earth. But, you got to love the buts in scripture, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. But, and then the rest of the verse 20 sort of tells it, right? Do the opposite of what I just said. Store up for yourself treasures in heaven. But what does that mean exactly, right? Does that mean like in the attic? No, that's not what we're talking about, right? That's not where the attic's there. It, treasures in heaven means something else. What, what does that look like? If, and, and, and let's explore that, right? The hard question Jesus presents to us here is where your treasure is, where is our treasure is sort of that's where the things that we value, right? Where do we put our hearts? What do we value? Jesus suggests that this is the key question of life. Where you put your treasure, that's where your heart will be also. What you value what you support, what you invest in, what you place value in. That's where your heart is. So this morning we continue our fall stewardship series. This time uh, it can be a a bit of a discomfort for some people, right? Because they kind of feel like uh, it's not really appropriate to talk in church about money. And as I said last week, if you're here for the first time, um, realize that I'm asking you to make a financial commitment to the church today. I'm not asking you as a new person here to do that, right? I'm talking to our congregation, our church family, uh, to be able to do that as we move forward. But only that you might be convicted of the words of Jesus and consider how you view your stuff here on earth and what kind of significance that might have or how that may change your value of that stuff. See, finances were an important part of what Jesus did talk about. Shouldn't that also be something that we talk about if Jesus thought it was important? One verse in five in the New Testament refers to money and property and people's relationship to it. One verse in five. Of the 38 parables that Jesus tells, 19 concern money, property, or people's relationship to them. Jesus said five times more about stewardship than he talked about any other subject. This means that he had said more about stewardship than he talked about salvation or preaching or baptism or any other of the major doctrines. It appears that God knows that if he can get us in right relationship with our stuff, in right relationship with the material things that are around us, it is not difficult for us to grow in the things that are spiritual and eternal. We put our hearts where we put our treasures. Our wills follow our wallets. Jennifer Garner asked the question in an ongoing campaign for a credit card company, what's in your wallet? For today, we ask, where are you spending your dollars and cents? If you were to look at the church budget and look closely exactly what we spend money on, you'd basically realize that it kind of boils down to two things. It boils down to people and place. 
The first is our personnel, which is true of most churches. About 50% of our uh, budget goes to pay for people, uh, our staff. And we don't have a large staff, but it's about half the amount of money that we have that we give to our staff. Make sure that we're equipped to be able to respond to the things that are happening in the life of the church. And then we've got our probably our second biggest expense is our building, the mortgage we have on this particular building. It's uh, the kind of number one and number two. Those are the two biggest things that are going to go to our budget. You can see them. They're right in front of you every week, right? And then from there, it you know, goes down into the paying for the electricity and the, and the landscape, but also paying for missions and program expenses and seeing it all out, laid out plainly to see you can kind of have a better understanding of what it is the church values. Well, what about you? If we were to open up your checking account app, and look at the expenses from last week or last month or the last year, what would it say about your priorities? What would, does your investment in the kingdom look like? And are there things that you're investing in that have eternal significance? If Jesus had your checkbook in front of him, would he write about the same kind of checks that you would write? Or would he write different checks? Let's be clear. I don't want any, I, I'm not interested in anything from you today. I want something for you. This isn't about me asking for money. This is me trying to help you become a better version of you. This is me trying to help you sort of get to a place of seeing that there are things that are eternal that go beyond the stuff of the earth. Our stuff and our desire for more stuff can overwhelm us and hinder us from seeing all that God wants for us. When we look outside of ourselves, we can watch, we can, if we can look outside of ourselves, we can catch the spirit of generosity and live that out. God gives us far more than we could ask or imagine. The overall discipleship of a particular person's life includes the things that they do in their walk. It includes the, the time they spend in prayer. It, it, it includes the, the time that they're reading the scriptures. It, it includes the time that they're in worship. But it also includes that which is in their wallet. It includes how you spend your money. It includes how you decide that your budget's going to be configured, right? It, it includes all of those things. Think about the new members that we just brought up in front of the church, Joshua and Angel. Think about their testimony. Think about the many other people in our town of Moore Park that are in a position that might be similar to theirs or maybe dissimilar to theirs. They have other challenges and other things that are in front of them. Think how God has uniquely positioned this particular group of people as a church in this particular time, in this particular place, in order to minister and bring the word of God, the good news of the gospel to this community. Do we want to do more of that or do we want to do less of that? My argument would be that we want to do more of that. We want to continue the legacy that has been here for so long and continue to do the things that God has done so well in and through us. So some of you have been thank faithful givers to this church for a very long time. And I want to say thank you and pray that you will continue to be faithful givers. The legacy of MPC lives on because of your long obedience in the same direction. And some of you have been here for a while and trying to figure out how deep you want to put your oar in the water. And for you, I think I would simply give, say, give giving a chance. Write down a number you think is absolutely doable on a sheet of paper. And then add a little bit more to that. So that it makes you feel a little bit stretched. So that it makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable so that you are actually having to exercise your faith muscles. Pray, and then write that number down on the commitment card. We need to do some things as believers that require faith, not just financial management. If you're a visitor today, I hope you return and give us a fighting chance as a church. We have amazing donuts after the service, right? You can join us right out there. And if you want to come to a dinner tonight and join us from 4 to 6, it's going to be fantastic. Here um, is what uh, my grandparents left me, right? It's, uh, I, the funny thing was in my notes, I put Dob Kit. And I had somebody who read my, my sermon beforehand. They said, what's a Dob Kit? 
Some of you are like, it's a, you know, it's what you put your shaving stuff in, right? But I had to, sh- say, you know, change it so it didn't say dob kit because some people would know what that is. And then uh, this is a, a tie which never gets worn at this church, right? Because we don't believe in ties until there's a memorial service and then somehow or another we believe in ties. But that's my grandfather's tie. Um, it's, it's a little bit thinner than some of the ties for a while, but then thin ties kind of came back. And so now I look like I'm cool when I'm actually not. Um, but uh, those are things that my grandfather left behind, right? But what did they really leave me? They left me the legacy of their faith, the legacy of their love of family, their, their work ethic, their joy and exuberance for life. I am who I am because, in part because of who they are, who they were in my dad's life and who they were in my life and so on. I carry forward the sense of kindness and generosity and compassion that they came, you know, has come through the generations to me. And my hope and prayer is that it continues with the the young people that are considered part of our clan as well. I hope at the end of the day that my kids aren't going through my stuff and thinking, I found this really cool thing and go, that's what dad left me was this really cool thing. But they might have a hole in their heart because of the conversations and because of the significant things that we were able to do as a family that put them in a place to depend and trust in Jesus more. In order for all that to happen at this church, in order to equip this church to be able to do that on and on and on, it takes financial support, your financial support. And so what are we doing here today? What exactly is In Gathering Sunday? There is a card that um, you could get your hands on probably in a couple of different ways. One way is that we sent them out in the mail, and so you might have gotten that card in the mail. Uh, The second way is that you saw in the pews uh, today. How are you doing? Good to see you. I'm just going to grab this out of your way. He's like, why is he walking towards me? This is not good. Um, That uh, In your pews, uh, there's one of those cards. Some of you um, actually online, um, you saw that there was a link that you could put your information um, in on a link. And so for some of you, you're going to look at the person next to you and say, they didn't move. And so are they are they not giving? And now you're getting judgy, right? Like, I give my card. Like, they make a lot more money than me. Well, they, they might have done it online. And so if some of you, um, if you're sitting and you're not moving, you can pretend to, to throw one in, right? If you just feel like you don't want that kind of pressure, right? You can write it like a, an encouragement note on the card and not put any, you know, or like write down the person's name of the person next to you and write down like $4 million. Right? No, don't do that. Don't do that. But mechanically, that's kind of what we're doing, right? You're, you're going to we're going to ask you to kind of place your faith and say, this is a number that I want to commit to for this next year. Now, let's be clear. There are times when life changes. Your financial situation changes. And for some of you, like you're looking at the commitment you made last year and things have changed. A job situation has changed. A financial situation has changed. Just let us know that. That's okay. We we can adjust. God is big enough to know that there are some people who've done financially quite well and they're giving more. And there's some who've lost a job and maybe they're not able to do that right now. And that's okay. It's, it's okay. It's not, this is not about like guilting you into doing something that you don't want to do. I don't want to do this, right? This is about faith building. This is about us building our trust in God more with the things that he's given us. What does this do? This allows us to help with the planning process of the church as we look at the next year. And then as the planning begins, then we kind of set that together and we put a budget together and we pray over our budget and say, is this how you want us to be the res- the, the, a steward of the resources you've given us? And then prepare, it then just prepares us then for 2024 and how we're able to be present in the midst of the community that we're a part of in this place of Moore Park. And so I'm going to invite the band uh, to go ahead and con- come up at this point. And we're going to, um, they're going to, um, Noodle behind. They're going to give us a little bit of music, so there's not that awkward sort of silence of like, uh, am I making my footsteps really too heavy, or you know whatever it is that you might feel awkward about. Um, and uh, for some of you, you this is the first you're hearing this, and you're like, I don't feel comfortable writing something down. I don't feel like that's responsible. That's okay too. You can send that in the mail. You can put it in an envelope and drop it in the office. You can send it. Um, you can actually go online and still click on that link and be able to just uh, type that information in if you don't want to write something down. In one of those ways, we're able to get a sense of what is the general sense of what the commitment level of our church is. 
And then from there, again, we, we plan the budget that's coming. And so, and you'll see that on the front side of that card is actually what we want you to fill out. On the back side, it's like, I wonder what numbers look like. And the back of that gives you a sense of, here's what 10% of an annual salary looks like. Here's what 5% of an annual salary looks like. If you'd like to know what 25 or 50% of that is, I'm happy to help you with those numbers as well. Um, I'm, I'm, in those moments, I'm a complete mathematician. Uh, things just magically sort of happen. So um, I'm going to pray um, for this time of ingathering. And then when I stop talking and stop praying and say amen, kind of for that point, for a few minutes, just come to the front. You can drop this here. If you're in a place where you can't uh, bring it to the front, um, raise a hand. Somebody will grab it from you. They won't look at it. You can fold it in half. You can drop it in there, and we'll, we'll do it that way as well. Is that good? Let me pray. Thank you, God, uh, for the faithfulness of this church, for their generosity. We, we know uh, for a fact in my conversation with, uh, with Angel and Joshua, they could have gone to another church. They could have been at a different place, but they felt like this was family and this is home. And we want to continue to be that for people in our community who are hurting, who are having a difficult time, who need to hear the good news of the gospel. And so help us to be good stewards of the resources that are in front of us. Help us to know and have wisdom to know how to contribute to the overall success of this place. We know that it is not just about one of us. It's about the collective of us. It's about being the church and how your spirit comes down and encourages and moves your church to be able to do things that on its own would not be able to do. We're thankful for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus, that you gave it all for us. And so as we seek in our hearts to figure out what it is we're going to give back to you, just be with us in that mental conversation with our spouse, with our family. And if it's just us on our own, what that might look like just in our own prayers. We give this all to you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. we uh, lay before you uh, these commitments. We're thankful for each life that it represents, whether there's a dollar on this sheet, whether there's a thousand dollars. It is not about a dollar amount. It's that which is going to change us, that which is going to shake us loose from our own possessions, our sense of fearfulness in the midst of an economy that seems unstable, that in the middle of all of that, we would say, we trust you, God. Do great things in this church. Do great things through the commitments that are here. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to give you just two uh, very practical sorts of things. We're going to sing the last song and then do a benediction. The last, there's a, uh, now a box in the back, okay? We're getting to a place where we're realizing that um, thieves are real. We've had our, our, our own uh, mailbox outside broken into twice in the last month. 
we're going to change the way we receive mail. We're actually going to receive it into, into the actual building um, so that someone can't take that away. And then the second is, um, typically you're, you would leave your tithes and offerings in the two plates that are there. If you're comfortable leaving it in the plates that are there, that's up to you. It, probably the more secure thing is going to be put in that box, which is locked, and then people then come back later and, and get it that way. So we're trying to be a little bit more secure and be aware that um, as we're doing things, um, thieves are trying to figure out a way to get in there, and we just want to uh, discourage that. So that's a great way to introduce this last song. It's awful. So um, would you just go ahead and stand listening to this last song? <laughs> to come forward is Eric Tapking. Um, he doesn't know it, but come on up here, Eric. Um, he's the uh, elder 
um, in charge of finance. And um, actually, what I need you to go to the back is go ahead and put that teapot on, because that's what elders do <laughs> in the church. No, um, I'm going to have you pick those up. Um, so there's a sense for you of like, oh, is the pastor going to see it and judge me and all these other things? It's like, no, it's for the finance elder to figure those things out. And so I'm going to put that in your, um, so if you lose those, it's, you get to contact all those people and figure out how, what happens to them. So thank you for that. Um, I just wanted to show that there's like, there's this chain of command here and we're making it happen. Uh, I'm going to invite Kelly uh, and Dan Birchfield to come forward. They're going to be um, here for prayer. If you're in a place in life as you're looking at this next season of Thanksgiving and Christmas, and it's your first time without that loved one, which is many of you, um, maybe you need some prayer to prepare yourself for the season that's ahead. And maybe you're just going through something tough, difficult. <clears throat> They're here to pray for you. We're here all the time. If you need prayer, reach out, ask us. We're here to pray. We're here to walk alongside you. If we don't know what's going on, the Lord did not give me the spiritual gift of ESP. So I can't read your minds and know what's going on. You got to let me know what's going on. But they'll be able to pray for you today after the service. And um, we hope you'll come back at four o'clock this afternoon uh, for our Thanksgiving feast. If you have not RSVP, just show up anyways. Bring something Thanksgiving y, right? Something. Um, and if you don't bring anything, just bring you. It is going to be a great chance to be together. It's very casual, right? It is not like you have to dress to the nines or something or wear a tie. No, just show up. It's a great chance to sit at a table, get to know people you don't know before. So receive this blessing. Go, knowing um, that the things of this earth, um, moths and rust, are going to take them away. But the things that are of heaven will never be taken away. Where's our investment going to be? Amen. Have a great Sunday and happy Thanksgiving. Yeah.